Google. Yeah, uh, like Christopher just mentioned, we are going to present technology with regard to gaming and serious games. We are Andre, Benjamin, and Andre. That it as it is as confusing as it as it sounds like. Uh, today's. Uh, by the way, we will not really stop to take questions because then, regarding people using chat, etc., it's going to take a lot of time to keep waiting for people to ask questions. So please do write your questions or raise your hand during the presentation, and between slides, any of us will then read your uh, question or stop to take questions. So please read, read those questions during. Uh, there are like a question section at the end, but there is no question section during. So do feel free to always ask questions if there's anything related. Um, all right, I actually need to press this button. Does it work? There we go. It's a bit slow. Uh, today's agenda, we will talk about, we will have an introduction about technology, uh, going more in depth on hardware and software, game development tools, artificial intelligence, healthcare future trends regarding technology. Then we will show the videos we showed uh, earlier. Then we will have a break also for a question session and also the paper discussion. And now it's fast. Uh, we also want to clarify that since tech is everywhere, we want to kind of clarify <laughs> or scope down a bit. Uh, technology is related to all topics within serious games. This is due to technologies needed to develop and improve anything related to serious gaming. Uh, in, and in this presentation, we will talk about technology in a general matter, but due to the broad topic of technology, we will go in depth on a few topics based on interests. The, the three topics you can see down below, AI, game engine, and healthcare, is the three main topics for this presentation. And this is due to uh, the these topics being the topics of uh, focus topics for the uh, for the papers we are currently writing. Uh, I will also start off by clarifying something else that the we will talk about technology in a new and more interesting manner. Uh, what is the difference between the these two pictures and technologies? Is that the leftmost picture, the bus controllers? is basically identical to a PlayStation controller. It is the same input scheme, but it's presented in a different way compared to the Guitar Hero controller that allows for a new input system and a new way of playing. Uh, this is the same in regard with technology, what uh, the differences between a PlayStation 4 controller and a PlayStation 5 controller, slight technology difference, but fundamentally, it's the same. And with regard to designing software and hardware, they're taking the same into account while designing. Slight differences. I know that the PS5 and touch screen, but yeah. Um, oh, I need to press this again. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, with regard in technologies and gaming. Uh, since the first gaming console came out in 1972, there has been in booms in home-based console gaming systems. Uh, for example, the PlayStation 2 was the best-selling game engine ever created with o game console. I mean, with over 158 million sales. With the Wii, also uh, a, a game console focusing very much on exe game and series games, selling over 100 million uh, examples worldwide. Many of these consoles uh, came with external or built-in hardware, like the Kinect, allowing for different in interface inputs. iToy, Kinect, Lightgun, etc. is many of these examples. Uh, also, over the last few decades, PCs are now common and everywhere. Think, la think laptops and home, home desktop machines. The technologies that came with a lot of these consoles, think Kinect, uh, Wii, Wii remotes, etc., are allowed to be plugged directly into the PC, <laughs> allowing for the development of games and programs using the hardware on a PC, allowing for new and interesting programs and software and, and etc. to be developed. One example of an uh, of a system that combines hardware and software is the interactive sandbox that we are lab uses that uses the connect from the xbox one or the xbox 360 to create 
a in-world interactive system. And with the improvement in AR and VR tech we see today, we see that uh, kind of technology plus gamification is being used in education, training, and rehabilitation, makes some real life and gaming on a day-to-day -day basis. We will go more depth and uh, more in depth on the various hardware interfaces later on in this presentation. Uh, this is a quote that came to mind while writing this. I'm not entirely sure when this is dated, but yeah. Uh, also, as seen here, gaming has become a lar large part of society over the last decades. Uh, today's software and hardware are capable of connecting millions of players together at the same time, think World of Warcraft as pictured, at the same time across multiple platforms, allowing for interplay that has never before been seen. Gaming is now a multi-billion industry, with the most popular games being cur currently being Minecraft with over 110 million copies sold worldwide. You can now play Minecraft on mobiles, every console available, PC, AR headsets, VR headsets, and on Android watches. It is, as far as I know, not possible to play Minecraft on a Samsung fridge yet, but apparently you can play Doom on it. Over the last years, mobile games has become the hot new gaming medium, allowing for extra games like Pokemon Go to exist. And in a market like China, mobile games are the most profitable games. I will now give the word over to Andrea. Oh, did I press the... Yeah, there we okay. go. So uh, let's... Well, before we go into too much detail on our focus topics, we will just mention quickly hardware. Uh, so uh, you might maybe be wondering why we... We mentioned this here and how it's related to serious games, but like mentioned earlier, you kind of need hardware to do basically anything. So without hardware, any software is basically useless. Um, for example, and in relation to hardware, you have like state of the art things like the 3090, which is basically unavailable right now to do things we've done for many years now, but faster and better. Examples will be shown later. So uh, I'll quickly go through some state-of-the-art products and maybe some possibilities. So uh, you probably have heard of the uh, well new thing called VR, right? Well, VR is just one small part of a, a group of things called XR, which is like a combined term for, well, not the phone, but is a combined term for all of these. So in most cases, when we're talking, we use VR, we just talk about another world rather than a specific term. Um, also remember when our parents used to tell us, don't look at the screen all day, your eyes will become squared. Well, here we are. We're putting screens five centimeters away from our eyes. So, uh, well, just quickly go through them. VR is the thing where you where you put yourself inside a virtual environment. Uh, AR is where you put the virtual environment into the real world, kind of like how IKEA does it with the place thing. Uh, and it's fairly common now. You can use your phone or whatever. Um, basically, any computer can probably sh have some sort of AR in it. Uh, MR is where you basically combine the VR and AR and create a world within our world. And that's starting to become a bit more common now that some tools are available. For example, the Microsoft HoloLens. So uh, let's think about, for example, how a virtual uh, what a virtual world could do to gaming. For example, if a monster attacking your city and you play with fellow gamers to hunt down the monster, you can go and do that outside in the real world and still experience like a game. Um, Theory will be mentioned a bit later, but for example, using mixed reality, we can have health benefits. For example, in the paper, we they stated that clinician is provided with a real-time biofeedback, which can be viewed like this, for example, with the mixed reality, where they can see the patient and they can also see the doctor, but have, co well, they can be over thousands of miles away without needing to actually be physical, physically there, which uh, becomes a more 
practical and um, let's say useful approach to the medical benefits because you don't for people who are are stuck in their chair or stuck in their bed or something and can get the doctor without them having to come to them. Um, next, we'll mention some quick body controllers, which are fairly common right now. You have the eyesight, for example, which is getting a bit old. The Wii, which is still working. It's, it's getting not as much use as the other ones, but it's still fairly enjoyable, especially for older people, as the Wii has lots of uh, games that fit those kind of people. The Xbox Kinect has a in interact interactive ability that works with both the Xbox and a computer. Um, and then we have like the Omni One, which is a new VR experience, which allows you to move and run and do all everything like you were in real life, except you're stationary. Um, you can also adapt controllers. For example, in the paper we we're mentioning later, the participant noted that they having a game that is more having a game that is more more related to uh, a personal hobby or something that I have previously done would have a greater enjoyment. And using the tools similar to um, using tools that are built for that kind of thing, for example, a fishing rod, might people might be wanting to do that, use that to, to uh, rather than just a game controller. It also helps to cater to personal ho hobbies, which also increases the level of enjoyments of the game. And for example, can help them continue using a system even if they are kind of tired. Um, next, I'll mention some cloud computing because that's the fancy new thing, which is a, well, you can say that's basically let someone else take care of the hardware. Uh, it's kind of commonplace now, Amazon, Google, many more are kind of using cloud computing or they are taking care of the computing on their servers and then somebody else and we can just comp uh, use the software instead. Um, and speaking of gaming, NVIDIA GeForce Now and Stadia is two, ex is two of the more recent gaming related uh, things that has to do with cloud computing because you're basically just renting a piece of hardware on a server somewhere far away. So you don't actually have to own the hardware yourself, which is cheaper in the short term, but might be more expensive in the longer term. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, I don't think I have the timestamps available, but yeah. Uh, common to what Jungina said, the problem is uh, that a lot of these things, at least when we are AR and cloud technology, etc., they have kind of been popping up throughout the ages. Like I've been reading a paper or a book about VR technology in regarding to rehabilitation, and they talk about research that was done in the early 1990s but it's currently now in 2010 plus plus that we're currently getting it out to the people and common folk. Same with the AR glasses, etc. There's a lot of research being done, but it's currently impossible more or less for a normal person to get access to say the HoloLens, etc. even though it has been a thing for the last five years. So it's kind of hard to know, uh, know when things became popular or out on the market but yeah for example with the Wii etc that was in the late 2010 etc and a lot of the stuff we will talk about is from the mid 2000 to 2010s ish especially with the VR uh, stuff okay so well when we talk we already talked how hardware is important for the, the game development company and so we have to talk about these core components, which are the GPU and the CPU. This is a demonstration by NVIDIA with the Mythbusters where they showcase the it's a analogy. Like in the left, you can see how CPUs do serialize um, operations. Uh, this is a, a simple way to put it. Uh, sequential uh, operations while, and they, and they have a non, a, gen, a general purpose um, 
while the, G the GPU on the right, they usually do operations in parallel and they could do, um, they do simpler operations and with a specific purpose. Um, these components, uh, they improved over the years and they made it more accessible for the creation of the games. And overall, they increased the computational power. Um, okay, so well, at the forties, the computers would take the whole floor of a building and today we can do numerous more operations with the co a computer that fits in our hands. So, uh, I remember once I was uh, went to a data center and they actually the building they bought it way bigger and they fit a lot of uh, big machines there. I remember they even showed us one that they couldn't sell, which they called the big uh, the white elephant. And and then it turns out they changed the over the years the equipments and they they were using about half the space they used to use. So this can showcase how the size changed the how we can fit more computational power into some well, storage uh, but uh, computational power in general in smaller uh, spaces uh, in 75 Gordon Moore uh, presented the that the num uh, proposed that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit would double every two years and this prediction did a good approximation since it um, and since then, they, they received the name of Moore's Law. And despite not being the only element relevant for overall computational progress and other factors like memory, memory speed um, that do not follow this growth rate, it is one of the factors responsible for the growing computational power. And, we, and it's good to showcase how, how it's increasing. And and how do, does the increase of overall computational power can help the serious game industry? Well, um, usually AAA uh, game development companies, uh, they tend to improve the um, elements in the game that try to push the hardware to the limit. So they increase the frame rates, the, the graphics are more polished, the better response time and etc. And and on the other hand, the serious the serious game industry they usually aim, they don't they don't aim for this extreme optimization, and they don't aim for this uh, to extract this much uh, from the hardware. But um, the the how to say this. <laughs> Well, they, they actually don't optimize it to the maximum, but they, it turns out that since it's not optimized, they actually use a lot of hardware. For instance, when you use a game engine, there is not that surf, uh, uh, serves a general purpose. You may have uh, way more operations or, or may more components that do not uh, directly, that you could have optimized and removed and they are not, they are not optimized for the serious game industry in general. So you just get a general tool, it will create your, your software there, but it's not 100% optimized. Um, well, back, back then, serious games were mostly made by whole companies due to its productive cost and development in, in accessibility and due to the complexity involved. Some companies like Wisdom Tree made uh, ports of their older games with small changes in order to produce some edu games. Uh, the game developing the development in general became more and more accessible with the use of game development softwares like game engines and game mods. Uh, the advance uh, of game develop game development softwares made the development cheaper, more accessible, and more viable. Also, with the advantages of these tools and uh, tools and hardwares, the performance of games of games developed with the, these tools have increased. But there are there are various ways to develop for to develop a game. Uh, we can, for instance, code code uh, your own engine, or use a game a game engine that use code libraries or visual programming. It is also possible for create mods for the games. So 
each approach has its advantages and disadvantages. Maybe the performance of the game do not, do not need to be optimal and the general purpose game engine can be used. Maybe the game is simple and it needs to be quickly developed so it can be developed using Scratch or a visual programming tool. Uh, maybe the game has already some simil similarities with uh, other games and can be easily adapted uh, from the other games and, and made a mod of it. And so there are various options. And what does the literature say about the selection of game engines for the, for the serious games? Well, we have this, uh, this paper from ba Bargav and v Vasudevarmurt, 20, 2015, where they analyzed, the, um, they analyzed 73 uh, serious games or serious game applications and classified them into educational, uh, educational simulation or educational, simula uh, educational si uh, simulation or VR, according with the game engine, they uh, use it to develop that game. So- Did yeah, you forget this... to skip slide? Oh, shit, no, sorry. So I actually forgot to. <laughs> uh, so this one shows the, um, some examples of some ways of, of developing the game with visual programming and mods. For instance, that mod from Minecraft where it teaches uh, chemistry. Um, okay, and okay, now we are here. So the, we have this paper, and they analyze seventy-three uh, serious games uh, applications, and they classify them into educational uh, simulation and VR. Um, and this is the the distribution they they found. One sec. Okay, and well, actually, oh, okay. They also analyzed another 100 and plus serious game engines based uh, series game and compared them, compared the 15 engines used in these games. For the comparative analysis, they used various features like the possibility of uh, support 2D or 3D graphics, among other features. Uh, these features were graded from five as uh, easy to learn and under understand and use, and zero, where the feature was not present in that um, engine. Uh, it is worth saying that the, oh, so I decided to sum all the values, but actually this not, does not represent a good, uh, it's not a way, a good way to represent it, but the, they have like 15, 20 columns, so I couldn't fit them here. But um, for instance, you, ca you can see that, uh, Unity had uh, reached 48, get, got 48. But maybe if it did, this tool doesn't support uh, 2D graphs and I wanna create a 2D game, the, uh, this wouldn't be an option. So I recommend Mark going to this paper and seeing, okay, I will develop a game that is 2D, it will be online and it will be for this um, uh, operational system. And so you can, actually select, but this is uh, j just the way I found to try to represent, to grade them. Um, oh, it is also worth saying that this was a 2015 paper and this technologies change very often. Uh, also, it's worth saying that they base uh, the grading system they use, it's not described. So they basically used their opinion about, it's easy to learn, easy to understand and okay. And he, here is, well, it's the second part of the table where they, they, care more, they care more about the programming experience needed, the scripting, the platforms and the license. Um, well, this is another paper, uh, Cohen and Kapralos 2015, where they did a survey of frameworks and game engines for serious game development. Could, uh, and they conducted a literature review extracting development related terms related to uh, serious games. And we can see that Second Life, it's, uh, it's a 2015 research and the Second Life uh, was the, actually the first option. And it was further described in the paper that uh, it's about mods in Second Life. So, um, 
And uh, we, I also found one uh, interesting example of the use of this Half-Life for series, this modding of Half-Life for series game. And it's a project led by Scott Diner from the University of Auckland, uh, where they can create various simulations of nursing scenarios, and they can share the experience with the students. So when I saw this, I got surprised actually with Half-Life that, and then I started questioning like, um, we actually believe that the literature review, they tend to consider games, the, they tend not to consider games not published in papers usually. Uh, so that means that some of, some of the commercial games and games made by common users with no commercial purpose, uh, like the ones made in, with Scratch or RPG Maker, they might not be included they, and its relevance might not be acknowledged uh, despite they are possibly possibly being very relevant for the serious game development scenario. But since they are not in the literature, they are not very, uh, they are usually not linked in those papers. Right, so I'll go quickly through some of the, what AI can do for you. Um, though um, it's used in gaming, but uh, it's mostly fake. Uh, so, and I'll also mention some types of AI and how does this relate to gaming. So first let's st start up just basically what is AI? Well, um, you have a smartphone, no? Uh, well, dumb question, but most people have. Um, did you know that you're basically carrying an AI sort of in your pocket? Um, some of you probably do, well, most of you do actually, but it's not actually a full-fledged one. It's just a part of an AI, for example, the voice recognition. So your friendly neighborhood Google and Siri will kind of always be there with you as long as you're using the these kinds. And AI will need data or uh, statistics and information about you to be more personalized. Um, of course, every for example, most games you play will have some sort of AI or some sort of collection uh, collection of data, and that can be used to improve an AI. Um, for example, take for example how Google is collecting data wherever you are, and they use that to improve their AI. Um, so you you could, for example, use an AI if you have enough data to bring out a, to make a personal trainer that could bring out your own greatest abilities. So someone who knows your limits, someone who knows when to push you the extra mile, that's probably where the AI will come most in handy in, in terms of for personalization um, and how it's related to you as a person, because it can notice if you're running on fumes and will help you get back on track. And also speaking of personalization, in the paper we will mention later, they talked about having like an automatic calibration to to suit the user of a game. So, for example, you could um, well people with disability might need to have a more personalized gaming experience to allow for better enjoyment. So, having something that could read your inputs and adjust the challenges to be more suited to you is important and would help very much. Um, well. Also, speaking of AI, let's not confuse the procedural generation with AI, because procedural generation seems like an AI, but is in fact not. Um, procedural generation is, it generates a new object environment or whatever else based on a preset algorithm, rather than letting a computer do everything itself. Um, uh, for example, uh, it's by far the better choice when it comes to creating new worlds or populating an environment as seen in the uh, Left 4 Dead's director. Or if you well, we mentioned Minecraft, which also uses mostly procedural generation to create the worlds. Um, the, so if you take the image uh, below, which is the how the AI system works uh, for the Left 4 Dead game, it's uh, in the upper part of the image and the upper part left side, you will see a graph of how the survivor intensity increases based on the population of zombies or monsters, if you will. 
and that when a player encounters a monster that it will increase in the intensity so once the intensity reaches a maximum point for example right before the relax the red part it it will um, stop spawning players and allow player to just relax and patch up and do that automatically um so once and once the ai notices that the player is re re sufficiently relaxed the intensity starts uh, increasing again and they will start spawning more and more monsters um so say about you attach this to a full body sensor for training or even gaming and uh, this allows you for well if you use this kind of ai for that kind of purpose you can allow the the user of this sensor to even further become better and more trained because it knows when to increase or decrease the intensity of the game um, this can also al allow you to like track how how uh, well it can track the data and and could then be relay relayed to an acting physician and help the patient get even better so think about, for example, the rowing game in the paper was selected, where they used a musical and visual cues to aid the patients in in when they should row harder and when they should row. Now combine this, for example, with the director, and we get a smart system that adapts to the user. The paper, while well, the presentation by Mike Booth is fairly accurate even today. Well. Let's also mention decision tree, which most people working in computer probably know. Uh, the simplest form of AI, if you can call it that. Um, most people working in gaming will often use this kind of thing to fake the intelligence of the non-player character and make, make the AI choose specific things based on the action of the player. The goal is in the final node of the tree. Uh, and it could be kind of classified as a simple fake AI rather than a full AI. Uh, let's skip to a full-fledged AI. So I'll just quickly go through what a true AI might be able to do. So it does not need to fake the intelligence. It can make choices based on what it sees and then can challenge you. But it takes a while to train. It is usually limited to what it is trained on. Take, for example, the um, multi-agent hide and seek by OpenAI, excellent paper and very funny. Uh, and AI, well, so it's only as good as it's fed. Um, the the in, in the paper they made an AI play a game of hide and seek. That's the image for see the image. Um, the seekers are locked in place for a couple of seconds, where the hi hiders can hide. Uh, the first couple of runs, the AI will run around like headless chicken trying to figure out what tools they have available. So, uh, but while playing the game, they discover progressively more complex tools to use um, while playing this, this simple game. This will, of course, lead to the AI learning to hide. Uh, the seekers have learned to seek, and the hiders have now learned to block the entrances to hide themselves. Well, um, now that they have learned to hide, what does the seeker do? Well, they decide to use a ramp, which you can see. And they use that to get inside. Of course, note the amount of runs below the image. This is millions. So they they it takes a while to train. Of course, while well, saying that, um, the AI can, of course, learn to block themselves so well in that the seekers cannot get to them. And then the AI might try to do unexpected things. For example, glitch the game. Now, uh, this is probably one of the better and more recent publication by OpenAI. So we'll look at some other examples of used in games um, and to challenge a more professional player of gaming. That's Let's start with StarCraft II, which has uh, has had its success. It's fairly well 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 known ish um, for people who know StarCraft II and have played it. Um, problem with training an AI to beat a professional player is that it requires extensive training time. 
So for example, for an AI to beat a professional player, they had 200 years of real time StarCraft play experience, and that's per agent. And there they had about uh, 600 agents, which is a total combined training time of uh, 120,000 years of training. Um, of course, they this should have been a GIF explaining or showing how it thinks, but we'll skip over that. Um, anyone have know the played Dota? If so, they just OpenAI decided to build a AI for that too, and it can actually beat the uh, the pro players and has a 99.4% win rate. It took about three years to train it, but it could also, but this also meant that it could estimate to win uh, uh, exactly halfway through the game. They could know when they could win. Um, future, well, for future trends, well, we know you can train AI to play, play in specific games, but that doesn't mean it's it, it will only work in that type of game, and that's it. Um, of course, you can use utilizing AI functions for to improve play experience, but though none have uh, implemented that in a full game yet. Um, right. Right. Me again. Uh, currently, according to a paper called Future Trends, Trends in Exegaming Using MS Connect for Medical Rehabilitation, it is estimated that over a billion people will soon require some sort of care due to aging or handicaps. And many researchers are now looking into ways to improve the quality of life of patients in new ways using technology and gaming. When increase in patients, it is not uh, possible anymore to guarantee that everyone can get individuals care whenever they need it. Especially now with the corona epidemic, it has been apparent that in-person training and rehabilitation isn't always possible. Uh, and then using technology, it is possible to create games and simulation that makes people more motivated to train at home and get proper rehabilitation. Uh, especially healthcare has over the last decades tried to add uh, serious games and more and more into the repertoire. Uh, the, uh, some of the good things with uh, serious games and technology for uh, healthcare, you know, for patients, etc., is that games can be customized for every patient and every situation. It can, for example, be customized for bedridden patients they can also be used for educational purposes to, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, read the Suresh uh, comment. I don't know if Andre, I want to comment on that. No, well, it's that's exactly why it's so interesting because it can allow it to become even further and it's more, mm -hmm. can be more, uh, well, the, like you said, analysis is easier adopted. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, as I was saying, uh, it can be used for educational purposes for the patients who are uh, dealing with a disease or handicap, etc., to learn more about their individual uh, handicap. Um, the, the technology now allows wheelchair users, people with prosthetics, uh, people who can't move properly, etc., to use their prosthetics, wheelchairs, or eyes as input devices for gaming, etc., uh, over at the gaming course a few years ago, we had students create wheelchair uh, games where you literally used your wheelchair as a gaming controller or a gazing uh, input systems. Uh, game uh, Serious games, especially extra games, are excellent at motivating uh, individuals with decreased motor functions to exercise, as seen as many papers. Exegames makes repetitive, boring tasks more motivating, according to many stu uh, papers. Papers like Serious Games for Cognitive Training and Ambient Assisting Living Environment, and Serious Games and Rehabilitation, Physical Rehabilitation, and Connect Best Exegames tailored to Parkinson patients, all state that patients drop, uh, uh, drop out of repetitive rehabilitation programs due to lack of motivation and enjoyment. This can then be countered with Serious Game and Gamification methods. Text can also be used to rehabilitate patients when they're out of the hospital, giving healthcare workers access to data they can later use for improvement. 
Uh, it is also stated by a few serious game papers that uh, training uh, individuals to use the new, say, prosthetics, wheelchair, etc., is easier when the training is done in a gamified gamified fashion. Is there uh, is, yeah, gaming love to make repetitive tasks fun, which makes people more in, uh, inclined to do it for an extended period of time. Uh, healthcare has also started taking advantage of VR and AR in terms of education and training of personnel. It's kind of hard to separate simulation versus serious games, and we have we haven't really done that too much in this presentation or our review. Uh, to kind of show off the extent of this, um, or, or, or how much effort it is put into making serious games and technology available for rehabilitation uh, purposes, the the European Union in, two, in 2011 until 2014 founded a project called the Revive Project. It was, uh, it was founded by the Seventh Framework Program that developed an integrated and field tested an innovative virtual reality based rehabilitation platform system based on multi-level rehabilitation. Uh, they wanted to, as I uh, stated, many uh, patients aren't able to get proper uh, training and rehabilitation at home, and they wanted to look into how to use technology like we are, etc., to make the rehabilitation at home better. Uh, it was kind of difficult to find the results of this uh, project, but there has at least been 39 publications based on this uh, three-year study. Uh, this is to show. Oops, this is to showcase how the extent of this uh, program. There were a lot of countries involved. Uh, on the more software side of thing, uh, many games now has a lot of access accessibility options. Uh, as seen here, you can see the Last of Us Two accessibility options provided to the players. They had over sixty different accessibility options some of whom were rebinding every key, blind options, high contrast option, option for deaf people, call blind options, slowing the game down for people struggle to struggle to read, and just generally making the game more adaptable and personalized for each individual when it has been needed. In terms of future trends and current trends, we are looking, uh, people are looking at new interfaces, especially regarding to you know, checking your body and uh, tracking your body and using that as an interface for serious games. Uh, with Elon Musk Neuralink, for example, comes to mind, and I'll showcase some of that in the not too distant future. Uh, the EHG based interf headband interface has been a thing for many years, but it's not very good, sadly. As mentioned before, the omnidirectional treadmill and VR is still being developed and utilized by many. It is not really commercially available yet, but I know that say Trondheim has one in their VR lab. I am envious. Uh, other than that, we see a lot of experiments being done by mobile on the mobile uh, side of things. Edge computing and a AR is still under development, especially if you follow the mobile course problem with mobile is often that it seems to we have seemed to meeting a hardware limitation. And also, as mentioned before, it is hard to get access to hardware comparatively to earlier. Good luck getting a Steam controller in Norway, for example, or a GPU in the current market. Uh, and we see in terms of trends, we see a lot more accessibility in gaming, at least in the software side of thing. People are fighting for the colorblind, the deaf, the blind, or with vision impairment, etc. And Microsoft released a adaptive controller, which is a hardware-based controller where you can customize it based on physical handicaps. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. Um, skip that one. I think we're running out of time. Uh, can you press play? As you can see, Pager is amazingly good at mind pong. He's focused, and he's playing entirely of his own volition. One of the things the Neuralinks allow Pager to do is to play his favorite video game. Pong, can you press pause? To yeah, as you can see in the video, you can now see that we are uh, people are currently experimenting with direct brain-fed 
uh, or input systems to control gaming. That could be very interesting in terms of VR development, AR development, and especially for rehabilitation purposes. And uh, you can see. oopsie, hey. I can apparently press play video from my screen. Also, I see that we have this video takes one minute. We just run out of time. Uh, with regards to technology, etc., I want to showcase this video. It's a bit over a minute long, where we you showcase where it can showcase how you can use all technology or, or already existing technolo technology and in in a new and fascinating matter. Uh, this has never been seen before in a video game, even though the technology has been there since forever. Uh, the boss! Uh, uh, epilepsy warning, by the way. There's some really bad flashing lights. Um, the boss! I'm putting the hood on. Moving. What? I didn't know you could do that. Not cool, I but uh, Hey And stop. get sent go Yeah, we are three minutes over time, so I think I'll stop it there. But you actually have the boss. I, I'm I press next slide. Uh, no questions regarding the first uh, portion of the presentation. Just continue. Well, let's ask the audience, see if there's any question that anyone has, because there was quite a bit of material that you provided us with. Um, well, I was, hope was, so. Was there, was there, any, was there any, any surprises, news, or uh, you know, uh, observations that anyone made? based on the tech. I was actually surprised that the PlayStation 2 was the presumably most popular game console ever. Be Still is. Uh, exactly, um, because it's so relatively old, right? So, I mean, you would imagine that the demand uh, would go up more recently. Um, I think it was due to it being so cheap and many people used it as a uh, multimedia player. I see. It was basically a cheaper DVD player, also a game control console. I see, okay. Same, yes. Yeah. The, the, it was also unlockable, so you could play any game. You could just uh, burn the disc and you could play it. There is a way. So, especially in Brazil, it was very popular to kind of pirate and a lot of games right. for free. Definitely, the animals easy to hack. Yeah, the same with the PlayStation 1 as well. Uh, I skip, we did actually skip that slide uh, due to. Uh, no, sh this is bad. Did I? Yeah, I. But no, don't want to fight with want... the video. Now, the slide where we talked about, uh, especially the military, using PlayStation ah. 3s as uh, customized uh, or special uh, mm. supercomputers. The hardware and software in a lot of these gaming machines were so cheap and so effective. Uh, for example, in 2010, the US military uh, connected uh, 1,700 PlayStation 3s to build a supercomputer. Because <laughs> uh, the uh, PlayStation 3 could be unlocked and uh, run Linux on it. 
And oh, also okay. the PlayStation 3 was also relatively used uh, by many due to its cheap Blu-ray possibilities. Same okay. with the PS2. And it also lasted for a longer time than it probably should have. The Wii was also very cheap. Same with also PlayStation 2. I see. Interesting. Cool. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to skip over <laughs> the videos. Because, yeah, I don't have full access. So. But I sense there are no questions immediately from the audience. I think it's a really interesting topic to, to look into those directions. And you um, highlighted the important um, uh, trends qu quite well. But in order to bring it back to the CS game perspective, to integrate a bit, I think the paper can help us a bit. So yeah. um, just have a go and, at the paper and introduce it to us again. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, we uh, are going to talk about the paper, Design Guidelines for Developing Customized Series Games for Parkinson Disease Rehabilitation rehabilitation using bespoke game sensor. It's the longest title of the papers I've had a look at it, I believe. Uh, and it is very relevant for at least my area. I did pick healthcare and rehabilitation mainly in the focus for uh, serious games. As we also talked about earlier uh, in this presentation, a lot uh, of large companies and smaller companies, researchers, etc., are currently looking at how to use technology to increase or help rehabilitation and healthcare. Uh, oh, yeah, still need to press two buttons. Uh, we assume that a lot of uh, viewers haven't really actually read the paper. So to do a too long didn't read of the paper, the, pa the paper proposes a, um, some guidelines for the uh, development of uh, we are based rehabilitation games. This paper does mainly focus on Parkinson's disease, but it tries to also generalize a lot of the guidelines and the research being done. They state the paper state that physical rehabilitation increased quality of life in the patients, again, with focus on uh, Parkinson's disease patients. Um, they do also believe that low cost. They use low-cost and customized off-the-shelf motion capture systems for the development of their pilot case. They want to make serious games for individuals with low motor cap capabilities or extreme handicaps. They want to translate uh, traditional rehabilitation exercises into gamified systems or VR, etc. Because as we discussed, many believe that serious games allow repetitive uh, exercises or uh, yeah, exercises to be translated into gaming, and those are more fun and interesting to do. They state that it promotes challenge and, and competition on both an individual and social level in terms of multiplayer based gaming, etc., and rehabilitation exercises. They state that the games that uh, should be made for handicapped uh, personnel or individuals should include automatic calibration and customization based on player needs. They go a lot in depth about how the people, individuals with heavier motor uh, limitations have problems playing a lot of games, especially those that are off the shelf designed for younger people. And they also state that you need to do patient-led design approach in terms of designing and developing a uh, serious game for rehabilitation, rehabilitation purposes. Uh, the findings of the paper is to quote the paper games based on familiar playful activities and hobbies can increase engagement. Uh, as shown in the paper, they use a rowing game and a pipe game the pipe game doesn't really translate into a real life activity or hobby, but they found at least that there was a, lot, a large enjoyment in relatable tasks. Again, with the patient led design approach, this is what I found to be the best one having the patients or experts in their field into this design approach. The design process early on helped a lot, especially if there's a bunch of programmers that doesn't know the individual's need and the special needs for the particular handicaps, etc. That has to be taken into account early on. It is very hard to make games that fits all, especially since the individuals within a group can also very differ, uh, can also differ extremely based on how bad um, their handicap is is uh, let's rephrase that. 
uh, with the Parkinson's disease, there's a lot of stages on how uh, bad an individual is, individual is currently dealing with their Parkinson's disease, which means that it is difficult to take that into account, even if designing a game for Parkinson's diseased individuals. And again, various groups needs many different customizations. Uh, the, in terms of theory, the paper never states any concrete theory uh, concretely, but it talk about a lot of various features from different theories, which is why we extrapolate a lot of the theories that has been taken into account while designing the spider study and the paper, like flow study. They can't be too hard. People found it uh, became irritated and annoyed when it was too difficult, impossible to do, and also it was too boring if it was too easy. Self-determination and motivation and gamification is also uh, hinted at throughout the paper, but never mentioned explicitly. Uh, to quote the another paper, virtual augmented reality and serious games for healthcare. In neuropsychology, VR is used to offer a human-computer interaction par uh, paradigm in which patients are no longer simply external observers of images on a computer screen, but are actively participating. Um, Specifically, is it possible to control and manipulate tailored exercise with meaningful ecological value and motivating virtual environments? Indeed, VR simulation can be highly engaging by supporting a process known as transformation of flow, defined as a person's ability to exploit an optimal flow of experience, as shown in the picture. Uh, from a psychological perspective, motivation is particularly important for patients consistently engaged in demanding and practice heavy cognitive exercises, which then goes back to the more boring repetitive tasks showed in the paper. Commercial games can be very hard for uh, uh, patients with Parkinson's disease to use, which means that they need bespoke and custom software and hardware to be used. And as mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, books like this, uh, a paper like this one and books like the serious games and physical rehabilitation book also state that the main dropout reason for a lot of patients is due to motivation, motivational issues and boredom. Uh, so we, dis we discussed some limitations in the paper and we believe that, um, well, we will further discuss how the one of these limitations is the fewer number of patients, but we will further discuss how how our reference project uh, from the paper states that testing with five users might be enough to, sh to cover 85% of the usability issues in a project. Um, but we believe that each individual handicap being unique, uh, five uses the um, five uses for testing would be too low and a bigger sample size would be more desirable for a for this, for a more general purpose um, objective like this one in the project, in the paper. Uh, this is a new field. So the, even the paper, they state that they are the first of this, of its kind, focusing on developing guidelines for the design of serious games for PD. PD is, if we talk later, it's Parkinson's disease. Um, this uh, this makes the design and the execution very challengeful, not being able to rely on past um, exper experiments. So this might have limited the possible results that could have been found with um, a more mature field. Um, we also see a lack of uh, long-term studies so even if the paper is new, uh, the field of study is not like the application of games with, for rehabilitation, but most studies lack long-term research and tend to have a small sample sizes. Um, we believe that uh, various results over time from the PD individuals would be more desir desirable for the objective of the project. And the paper, for instance, referenced the, um, a project that they use com commercial games, uh, not uh, properly designed for the, the specific purpose design uh, games. And it, it was uh, when they used these commercial games, it was actually noticed that the PD patients could not improve uh, 
uh, during the game while the control group improved. Um, we also believe that there could be some wrong motivation or study interference uh, where the, the patient the patient feel more motivated to train because they are uh, in a study and they want to act nice. And so this study interference might be. And also the, the study relies on qualitative uh, instead of qu quantitative variables, which is not a problem per se, but it's more uh, susceptible to subject variation due to being in a controlled, controlled environment, as I, I just said. And also uh, the comparative criteria is less uh, precise. For instance, saying that the angle of the movement of the upper limb increased by X degrees, um, which might, for instance, in this example, it's the improvement of the exercise, uh, might present results more easy to compare and re replicable among other um, scientific works. So it's easy to grade, to, to, to see progress uh, in other works also, among other works. Or other works. Uh, so another uh, thing is the determination of improvements. Are our scores improvement reflect in real life improvements as well? Uh, this was not going depth in the article. And like for instance, if you increase your your uh, score in the game, does it mean you improved in uh, in real life? By how many? What is the proportion? You know, this is something that was not in depth gone in depth. Right, and a greater picture of this. Well, um, since this is kind of a design framework, we can safely say that it can be platform independent as you can mostly design your own things based on these ideas. It, um, though the paper might be more focused on a specific disease, the overall paper aims to be aims to be a more generic and can function on multiple diseases or problems or handicaps. Um, since it's a patient-driven design approach, we can specifically tailor games for these kind of sicknesses or illness, uh, what you want to call them. And this can, in fact, increase enjoyment as they feel it's more usable to them. And of course, um, as mentioned in the paper, uh, games designed for diseases tend usually to be using mostly just assumptions when building it, though um, you might need to be more familiar with how rehabilitation works. So you need somebody who knows uh, that to design a good game for that kind of disease. Right. So we'll... That is what we have. We want to start with open questions first, and then we have some specific pointer, pointers later on. Cool. Well, thank you very much for the for the overview again. I think you went uh, quite deep into the paper already. I think anyone who has read the paper should have drawn, and you also drew interesting conclusions already, or relevant conclusions already. You kind of put the, identified the pain points of the paper itself. Um, so, but it would be see it would be good to see what other people thought about the game. Um, well, the paper more generally. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. Like we said, we have some uh, question like conversation starters uh, later on, but we want to hear if people have some input, discussions, questions, etc. Before we lead mm -hmm. on with those. But while people type or not type or um so um perhaps uh, one one thought or question i have and you mentioned andre just now as well um no long-term studies and aspects like this i mean this paper um while claiming to be the first of its kind in a way nevertheless is from 2014 right so um has been quite some time since it was uh, actually published so this is like half a decade already slightly more than that um did you see any development in this field or even um follow up studies by the corresponding um, um uh, authors or you know by the by the authors referenced in the in the paper did you see any um didn't check honestly mm. 
Uh, I do believe a lot of the claims and statements they kind of have has been kind of been the same statements and claims that I've seen uh, from 2014 and onwards in terms of it's kind of hard to know how much rehabilitation and hardware uh, assisted tech etc can help in uh, with the depth uh, of the V uh, it has also kind of fallen a bit out of flavor to design the easy accessible um, easy to access and accessible uh, extra games etc I mm. know that the switch is currently coming a bit back but sure. uh, the, the connect is nowhere in there to be found and uh, all of the uh, studies has basically relied a lot on the Wii, Wii board, etc., uh, Wii Fit, and uh, PlayStation Move, etc. And mm-hmm. there's still not a proper conclusion on the effectiveness of rehabilitation series games. A lot of them say it is very effective. Some say it should be combined with traditional rehabilitation, etc. But it, they seem to kind of be stating the same thing as this paper. Mm-hmm. I have not read a lot about uh, Parkinson's disease specifically, but other uh, physical handicap papers seem to kind of state the same thing. Right. Oh, and it can also be mentioned that since it's still like mere six years, more or less, it, it could still be in progress and the final result might not come out until a couple of years uh, in a couple of years. Granted, uh, if, if there was something like this, but uh, usually those authors wouldn't hold back advertising this or kind of having intermittent um, 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 responses or in, intermittent um, updates if that was to be the case. Um, but one, one easy way of figuring this out basically is often to just look at who cited them, right? Because those authors tend to cite themselves. Uh, if, oh yeah, defensive. I mean, and... we didn't, we forgot to check that, uh, yeah. but uh, it, it's a kind of general limitation of these kind of uh, kinds of study is that it often yeah, yeah. lasts from everything from three weeks to six months. I do believe the longest I've seen so far mm. was three years. Okay, that's that, long. Yeah, uh, that was about uh, rehabilitation and training of elderly people, which again mm. go, went back to people having more enjoyment, people having more fun and exercising more, and also mm-hmm. building upon familiarity, you having them inside, having the patients uh, involved in the design process, etc. Mm-hmm. This was for, for elderly, uh, etc. So it wasn't entirely the same, but again, physical uh, problems and uniqueness, etc. They kind of share a lot of the same findings, problems, and design choices. Now, the problem is, over three years, the hardware might die, which is also one of the conversation starters we have that, oh yeah, we designed for the Wii. Yeah, you can't find the Wii anymore. What are you going to mm-hmm. do then? Well, it seems to mm. not be a lot of questions. So should we just jump to the conversation starters we have? I think that wouldn't hurt, yeah. Yeah, uh, I do believe the first one is referring yeah. to, yeah. So um, like a conversation starter, since they mentioned that, uh, well, as no- Nielsen Norman, the um, a design guideline with the, you need like five users to get almost uh, as much, well, 85% of all bugs and problems with the game. Is that enough for this kind of study? Or is it, should you use more maybe? Yeah. Uh... Martina? Uh, Yes, so what we know is testing even on one user is better than testing on no no users. And yes, the the standard of five users from my UX work perspective uh, works very well. Um, Also, if you want to be sure that you cover 95% 95% of the cases, I have somewhere the, the other presentation from the uh, UX course when they were actually showing how many 
uh, you know, thousands of people you should uh, test to have this confidence, but uh, I think it was around 600 users to give quite big confidence for population of half million. So, you know, uh, there is, of course, un unachievable those kind of numbers if you don't have a proportionally big budget. So any test is a good test. The, the, I don't know how it is uh, in, in this case, but what I'm always um, taking uh, care about is to also to, to check if I'm testing advanced user or the regular user, because advanced user will find it. Whenever you put the button, the icon, the information, they won't leave the phone until they find it. This is advanced user, so probably you guys. But the regular users cannot find it. Six seconds after, I'm not interested. I'm going to somewhere else. But of course, so here we have a different type of users. And I don't know if we can divide them for, so to say, advanced or not advanced. Maybe we there are some kind of other limitation that you may uh, call. Uh, but that was just my uh, experience that I wanted to share with you. Yeah, definitely. That is kind of in the normal use case, though. But as they kind of mentioned here, they do vary, vary quite differently in terms of the how severe their handicap is, which is what we kind of raises as a question in terms of how effective and how can we kind of guarantee that this will be effective for, say, all Parkinson's disease patients compared to only the few use cases or the few we have uh, looked at. You could also look at um, what kind of results they report. If all of the five users report pretty similar things, then that lets you know that, yeah, they're thinking in the same way. So maybe this is a piece of reliable information or I don't want to say evidence, uh, but yeah. if they have a lot of disagreements, then maybe you, you would consider that a bit lower quality information. Definitely, I do believe that is taken into account with the compare when they compare the uh, PD patients to the test group. They discovered that all of the PD the PD patients did have an improvement in was it three of three or four of the games they tested on, which then also builds on your comment. If all of them share the same similarity, it shows that it's actually correct. But if there's a lot of division inside the group, yeah, that's a lot of hands. And one thing before we continue this is that uh, remember when we stated earlier that we think that because well it's they are elderly and they have a disease which is related to their type of disease so this could this be like they are too nice or could this also affect their they saying oh it, it works kind of but is five uses enough for this kind of thing or do you need more to be able to get an accurate reading on if it is. Moving on, maybe, uh, Runa? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the previous comment was really answering why my, my, our saying the same thing as I was thinking here. I mean, the, the, there is a difference between finding the design flaws that's going to irritate all the users and seeing if this is an effective and good way to improve a condition. So, so I mean, uh, I think what Norman is saying is, is uh, in general, the uh, quite a few of the, the design errors you make in the user interface, they are easily discoverable, but doesn't say anything about the efficiency or quality of the, um, uh, the uh, software in itself. It, it deals with the user interface aspect. So, uh, so, I, uh, so I think this is really the, the question here. I mean, you could probably find quite a lot of the, uh, um, the uh, design issues that would irritate the players, but whether it's going to be as successful in achieving the goal of the game, I think that's a very different uh, question. Yeah, and that's yeah, why we kind exactly. of raised that we, issue. We talked in the limitations about that, and like how can we set a score, and how, how would the improvement in the score reflect in the real world improvements? And this, we, they didn't go in depth about that. Especially since the Parkinson's disease severity score is self-reporting, which makes this kind of also hard to have a look at from a bigger perspective. Uh, Christophe? Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically just, yeah, uh, to some extent, again, going in the same direction there. It's really like, what are you testing, right? So I think there's also this an ontological challenge that we sometimes think about, 
you know, t at least us here in this this forum, testing means can mean something very different, right? Scientifically, testing means the effectiveness of an intervention. In our case, it often means, uh, you know, did we uh, uh, develop software properly, for example, or do we have a good uh, user design experience? So I think it's also about the terminology a bit to kind of weed this out. Um, that said, I mean, I follow the idea that from a design perspective, like with the five users uh, on often software development perspective, uh, you know, you, you need to follow the Pareto principle. And that basically says that you you are really quick, and Runa mentioned that implicitly, that uh, you're really quick to identify the, the most blatant, most obvious flaws, and afterwards, it really will be a very minuscule and marginal improvement afterwards. So, right, I think having five users, as Martina says, is better than nothing, way better, even one user is better, because most likely you get the, the worst glitches out, think about alpha testing style, right? But when it comes to actual, you know, reliability of the effect size, meaning uh, you know, can you put reliability that something prefers to that extent better than something else? It's not something you can reliably suggest at all. So there's always the the, the jump from uh, you know first establishing some sort of significance. There is some difference between you know the the, the two forms of interventions, but on also gain reliability, and that's where the large numbers come in. Martina mentioned that uh, uh, um, uh, both respect with respect to being representative, but also getting credibility, embedding uh, being more confidence that you know if you say something is 10% better, that it is actually tends for percent better as opposed to just being better whatever that means in the first place the fans, uh, anyway uh, just um, the same effectively just more elaboration on the same points yep please yeah especially when their goals was to kind of publish guidelines for physical rehabilitation <laughs> exactly. games they yeah. kind of need to be quite sure that this isn't just the five random people we took from a uh, rehabilitation home and it, actually it's quite general which is why we kind of question was five enough especially with a uh, physical disease that has that many variations just if i may immediately respond to you before i uh, uh, let go but uh, yeah, I just uh, but i think guidelines you're actually hitting spot on because guidelines implies something about methodology and Melis methodology sits deep once it's you know as adopted by let's say 15 other studies right suddenly it becomes the uh, one of the core ingredients of their corresponding studies that they rely on. So testing me methodology thoroughly uh, is, is of course absolutely reliable. So I would I would rather earn a side and be like overly scrutinous on those kind of papers as opposed to having one single empirical application that says, yeah, you know, for this particular case, for this particular application, we have a, this success where I say, yeah, okay, well, yeah, I don't have enough users, but you know, so let it be. But if anyone starts adopting this thing, uh, then I think that wouldn't be enough having this as a basis, right? Because you know, yeah. you're, you're building on the shoulders of giants as a metaphor and methodology yeah. is very susceptible to um, um, uh, testing. Yeah. We do actually have a few more, I guess. So I think we should move on. And I do believe, yeah, I agree with what Sir said. Uh, in terms of, it kind of builds on this one though. It's a comment that we made on how to get custom technology created from organized groups. It's that the comment from the paper states that it has to use quite specifically created custom tech and software for the individual users and to quote a lot of the rehabilitation papers uh, we have read, is that the handicapped individuals has very unique skill sets and handicaps, which means that that has to be taken into account when designing hardware and software. But they also want to make this kind of accessible for everyone. And do that doesn't really mix. You can't have custom super specific hardware and software that is complex to create and set up while also wanting it to be everywhere and on the shelves in every store, which is also the physical, yeah, serious games and physical rehabilitation paper states that cost of development is high. How do you get Microsoft, for example, to actually bother creating custom hardware and software? A lot of the times we have seen people either physically modifying or software modifying already existing technology like the Wii Fit board, etc. So I mean, should we then, I know that there are places that aim for a more open source um, standardized, yeah, in a way the perfect game will never be built, especially when, oh yeah, this is a guy that is like, literally lacking hands. How do you kind of make him play the same game as a guy who's lacking say legs or whatever, you can't really compare them, uh, sadly. Um, there has been a movement to try to make more 
open source standardized uh, rehabilitation platforms, but so far we haven't really seen too much of that being adopted. It is very easy to do on the software side, as I mentioned, add an accessibility option, add a translation option, change the fonts, that is easy. Creating custom hardware, not, not so much. And yeah, that was my TED talk. Uh, moving on, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I think it invites. It's a good, very good thought you have having there, and I think it invites for thinking. Um, it's just there's still the thinking process. I'm just wondering as to whether we'll experience a time where, uh, you know, in the in the abundance of production of new, uh, you know, technology combination and all the tooling and toys that have been out and out, that there will be bubbling up over time here and there certain features that are here to stay and may may make. Uh, sense, right? I mean, I'm, I remember remotely. I'm not really this 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 is deep into this uh, particular um, uh, 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 you know um, you know area, but I remember this this uh, nunchak nunchak what was it from the Wii uh, was really yeah, nunchak, held yeah. held held as really uh, revolutionary uh, from a basically from a perspective of user input perspective uh, control, right? Mm -hmm. And it was was so relatively simple, and you could also link it to a PC, for example, and use it or use it for other things as well, uh, like, you know, navigational activities, or it's just different forms of input that were prior unthinkable. So I'm wondering if we, is this there perhaps an implicit movement to get a repository uh, of, of all those different, you know, uh, patches or different different uh, 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 um, glances at different technology, meaning not the core, not the V itself, but you know that just in the ecosystems of whatever you know, uh, play console, PCs, whatever uh, sort of features come out that will al eventually allow us over time to kind of converge again, uh, and 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 then identify the right tool for the right job and assume and realize, oh, that's actually out in the open space, so we don't need a a dedicated tool for this particular uh, uh, case. I, I don't, I'm, I'm just my thinking, but perhaps I'm completely off and it, it doesn't make sense at all. But perhaps it's also be just to encourage us to be reflective on what's out there to see if you can purpose or repurpose this for something that would be responding to more, you know, marginalized groups or, you know, to, to custom needs for particular groups. Anywho, yeah. Now the problem then kind of goes back I think to Runa if has I a want a replacement uh, piece for my Guitar Hero controller from the early 2000s, I am out of luck though. The Wii isn't produced anymore, which means that it's not easy to get access to hardware and hardware components, especially when something breaks. Uh, Runa? I guess there's also this question of uh, how adaptable or how configurable would each type of interface be? I mean, if you think about a, a webcam type of interface, it, it can be definitely uh, be very much adapted to individual needs. Some of these uh, input devices are, are quite a, sh a small range of uh, modes. And I think what was happening is that uh, some of these more, um, uh, multi-mode, if you want, uh, input devices are those that will allow you to even adapt the input part of this. So the device itself might be the same, but it can be used and configured different ways. So, oh, yeah, so definitely. I, uh, the Kinect, for example, is mostly used for research purposes and rehabilitation purposes and other purposes where they have plugged it into a PC and not its original state of meaning in terms of yeah plug it into your playstation no no xbox i mean and uh play with it which also then builds on yeah and i know that especially microsoft has also made controllers that should kind of fit a standardized xbox slash pc environment that you can customize for handicapped needs and i do believe that has been due to people requesting it and then it shifting to more focus i guess on the marginalized group and handicapped people yeah, that is a problem. Who should you then take into focus when designing when, as the paper mentioned, that you need to take the patient's, the patient's need into, into mind when designing? And I do believe, to, to quote the book, Virtual Aug uh, Augmented Reality and Serious Games for Healthcare again, it's a long book, it covers a lot. It states that the development of VR technology for healthcare requires not only technical development, but an understanding of the context which the technology will be used, the people involved, the environment, practices, and processes it will be placed, which then builds into it being very different, difficult to create general or all-purpose tools. 
I say that, but suddenly the connect is used for everything again. The V is used on a PC setting. And uh, yeah. We do actually have like nine slides left, I do believe, but we have run out of time. One, 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 more, one more comment I have, and that is uh, oh, the, 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 uh, another question is uh, when we say something is adaptable, to what degree will it be adaptable to the individual or to a cluster of individuals? Because I mean, even though there's a diverse or a wide range of, uh, of many of these, uh, diseases and deficiencies and, and handicaps that you could in many cases cluster and that's what they do in sport so if you have uh para, para sport paralympics uh, it's not like everybody is competing in their own class because then everybody will be uh, uh, winners so, so you've got to group the ones that are similar that have kind of similar conditions and similar uh challenges so, so i think it's more of a how do you cluster and how do you group uh um, patients cluster and, attack and allow yeah. for individual and, and then you, uh, yeah. you kind of adapt to the clusters not to the, yeah. the real individual i do believe that is what to do in uh, i mean that is what they do in the paper they kind of create a system that fits everyone but allows for ai based personalization on the individual and also the technician slash uh, healthcare specialist can override and individually adapt systems. A lot of the Microsoft, for example, again, the Microsoft all-purpose multi-controller or adaptive controller allow you to then plug it into a interface or software interface that then overrides or is able to adapt it. The, with the Last of Us example we had earlier, the Naughty Dog didn't do anything in regard to different clusters, etc., they just open sourced or made everything possible, and then the individual could customize for their need, which then builds back to some people actually need to have some sort of technical understanding, though, to actually do the proper settings and changes. Uh, are we out of time, though, or should we just continue? Yeah, I think we're a bit out of time. Um, I think other people will have other obligations to make it best practice to be out of time, I guess, in this course mm. here. But, yeah. Um, so, I, I think it's but it's a really interesting and relevant topic. I believe. Um, I agree. I mean, yeah, it's, it's the role of technology, the interaction with um, other forms of, um, uh, you know, within technology, but also with the actual corresponding to domain, are really interesting and uh, relevant challenges that probably always want to keep an eye on, particular when you, you know. Uh, develop your report, but also uh, think about the questions you want to ask. I have the sense that we're coming out of this session with more questions to answer, uh, ask than answers to give in the first place. So it's a classical scenario of that very nature. Um, that but... was kind of difficult when designing this one because we couldn't just deep deep dive into one specific field because yeah. technology is hardware, software everywhere, and the last seventy years or so of development. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I think that's something to um, really perhaps uh, bear in mind. Um, yeah. So I think it's it's sensible to 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 I guess stop it here. But I want to um, say thank you because I think you did a really great job giving us this over overview, right? So and also kind of look be a bit out there in terms of the kind of both being aware of what the technological developments will be that we're going to face sooner or later. Um, but also aspects that people can look into when they want to kind of get a sense of what could be used in the area of serious games and hasn't been adopted yet. So you have been, looked a bit forward. What I encourage you as well, and, and you you started doing this, also to look a bit backward because, and that that, that sounds a bit ironic, but uh, in, in the sense that a lot of the things that have been developed, you know, or are introduced into the market more recently or not, are basically just reincarnations of something that has been developed earlier. You mentioned you made reference to the tech of the 90s, but even before that, it's just that in many instances, the technology facilities, be it computational power or uh, 3D processing, whatever else, wasn't really available, right? So, but it's just, uh, as, uh, plus it also is a matter of meeting the demand to some extent where we actually realize, okay, you know, every household uh, also of, of, you know, impaired individuals and so on that require rehabilitation has already that or that device, right? So it's not a, not such a matter that's kind of uh, builds on the uh, discussion we just had now. 
uh, that you need to you know uh, employ dedicated uh, technology but actually you can use what's already in there and it will of course be relevant in situations where uh, the healthcare system for example will not provide customized equipment in the, in the first place so which is uh, commonplace uh, in, in, in commonly the case in the world so i think there this this the software perspective can have uh, you know a great um, effect or positive impact on people's lives in the first place so i would encourage you kind of to reflect uh, on on this perspective a bit and see you know where's this interaction between research or technological progress on the one side but then also like the uh, you know accommodation of technology meaning the fact that it's actually freely and easily accessible in different households and i think this in the end as with most technology has led to the or will may lead to a wider uh, widespread adoption right else you will just have again you know like your, your progressive um uh, tech showcases but without any real inter uh, difference and i think for serious games because it's so practical also pragmatic if you like because it addresses a particular problem using you know uh, the principles of games slash technology it would be very important to kind of meet this um break even point of, of of you know availability on the one hand but also on the other hand uh, um, the 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 uh, meeting the needs of the customers in the first place or the which, clients or whatever you want which to is kind of difficult to do at least uh, in certain fields for example that as mentioned earlier the VR got kind of adopted in say 2014 but uh, try to find a guy who has actually played a proper VR game in its proper state and it uh, how it's supposed to be presented and played yep. you either have the VR hardware but you might not actually lack you might lack the computational power to run the game properly, and that's with the current state of the VR lab, or the opposite way around. You might have a decent PC, but having problems getting access to the VR equipment and hardware. And I, I do believe the software limitations of VR is kind of held back due to the lack of uh, adaptability of the market. Sure, but but give me let me give you one example where I see all the opportunities that I see that are basically come for free, and I mean that's really like Google Cardboard, right? So that very simple idea of using your smartphone that you have already and have this cardboard thing basically that you strip in your head and so on, and have your cheap low fi if you want even a VR solution. But the point is there's no um uh, economic barrier for anyone to use it anymore be assuming that they have a smartphone in the first place right and this will be just becoming progressively progressively more and more and more right so if you think about the google pixel and it's really uh, uh not revolutionary but but a significant technological milestone that it took with respect to support for vr and so on uh, or uh, at least ar facilities um and earlier phones as well but not as broadly this has become commonplace in all modern devices so if you cleverly link those things People don't even know, but they have the tech at home already. And that's the kind of angle I think that will pr define success, not so much, I, uh, you know, what's possible. Uh, at, oh at yeah, defensively. Yeah. Uh, the problem with also phone-based ARs, as as I mentioned, I didn't actually get to go in depth in on that uh, slide due to we ran out of time. Is that sure. phone-based AR has actually kind of met the hardware limitations though? They are struggling with improvement on phones and AR, and we are especially mm. due to battery capacity, right? Uh, and that's why we also brought up edge computing, etc. But but also I know that in terms of getting cheap VR out to the market, Facebook and Oculus, even though I'm disliking Facebook, is actually trying to make very cheap VR headset and yeah. very adaptable. Yeah. No, no, that's but, that's but I think, you know, those are all matters of time, right? So if you look at the technological space, look at, for example, right now, development in the battery space as mostly driven by electric vehicles, hmm. you know, part of this will also come over to the, to perhaps to, to, to mobile phones or, you know, portable devices in the widest sense without going, having, making any strong technological assumption here. But I'm just arguing is that there is always a bit of a flow over effect that suddenly make things that seemed impossible a few years back effectively solved a few years later, but just not by the same community that has looked at it for years, right? So it's always uh, it this disruption like, that you that you yeah, we are, see. We are, they, they try to develop and uh, execute VR technology a lot of times before it finally hit the sweet spot, but then you see the software drives hardware, hardware drives software. You kind of need that exactly. loop, and uh, yeah. it's finally now that we're actually starting to do it. But now we also see that in terms of, say, art of uh, augmented reality, AR, uh, I do believe that when the military, mm -hmm. the US military, stop sure. hoarding all the HoloLenses, we will actually get a decent like AR develop out on the market like instantly. We will not get the 
from crappy to good AR, we will just get the decent AR because the development is being it is being done. It's just that it's not available for the commercial market. Right. Like the Minecraft AR uh, Hololens thing was a few years ago, but I have literally seen two or three Hololenses out in the world so far, and I've tried to uh, seek them up. They are impossible to get, which means mm. that people are actually still developing on it, but it's hard to track progress. And um, they are, I do believe there are 40,000 Norwegian if you want to get it, which means that the adaptability rate will be zero, except in businesses, etc. Yeah. But you know, military is 10 years ahead of commercial market and then businesses, and then maybe people will start developing games on it. Mm. And I do believe, especially with uh, the Google glasses, etc., it was just 20 or 20 years too early, I guess. Yeah. But yeah. it's good to see that people are wa- wasting money to push technology. Also, if the if it's more easy to with the softwares to to develop this those games, it might be even more accessible because more people would be into it. You know, for instance, yeah. the PlayStation Two. Uh, you told about the how accessible it was. It was also easy somehow easy to create or custom games. So, well, back then, I, uh, the, there in Brazil, I could see a lot of custom games. So you, they would mod games, they would create some other games. So this also helped the popularity to increase. So maybe if the software development for these platforms, they get more uh, advanced, they can get way more uh, accessible as well. As you can see with the open VR and HTC Vive, etc., compared to the Oculus, it's like it's super easy to develop games and software for the and set up your custom stuff for the VR, uh, Ocul- and I, uh, uh, Vive, etc., and the publish on Steam comparatively mm. to Facebook. But you can also see that people are developing on PC versus no one is developing on consoles except AAAs or decent sized studios due to lack of access, etc. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's leave it at this. Um, I think people have obligations, including myself. So uh, oh, yeah, the th- then uh, uh, again, thank you very much for the overview. I think it was really good and uh, gives a lot of you know food for thought in any case. And then uh, uh, see if you can offer some reflections on this uh, oh, afterwards. You. Cool. All right. Susan Tuck. The next, uh, the remaining 10 slides will be emailed out to everyone. Yeah. That's good. Link them, link them in the wiki. That's probably easiest, or whatever, however you see fit. Uh, um, yeah. Because then they're more persistent, and let let people have a look at this. And uh, if there are questions, we could still bring them up either via issues or uh, in the next session. No, it was mostly a joke, but uh, I do believe most of the things we have discussed has been uh, taken up, uh, brought up. Not the three remaining ones, but yeah, yeah it was basically like hmm. adoption, hardware, okay. dangers, etc. All right. So guys. Thank you very much.